When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those whose hearts are simple, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Uh, I just, it's, it's curious, uh, facing a very small group of people on a Sunday night here, there were actually, I don't know, maybe a few more or fewer people at the 5.30 Mass, and Father Daniel referred to them as representing a remnant. Probably most people don't get that reference. It's a biblical reference to, and we're going to come back to it in just a minute. That's why I'm mentioning it. The remnant were the small number of people who were left in Israel after the country was destroyed by the Babylonians. They took all the important people away, and they left a remnant. So all the important people are watching the football game. And this is a remnant. Now, with, with this, there's two problems. You can have two extreme reactions to something like this. When you're a tiny group of people who aren't participating in what everybody else is participating, you can either think of yourself as kind of a loser, you know, who doesn't even have a place to go tonight, uh, which would be a mistake, uh, maybe. Uh, or, or you can think of yourself as superior to all those people who are wasting their time eating and drinking and watching football. That's also a mistake. Uh, but both of those, the, the, both the, the funny expression about the remnants and also the three, re it's a good way to enter into thinking about these readings. They're very difficult readings, as I said. They're difficult to get at the truth of them. And I think it's particularly dramatic to see them in a place like Cornell. The question I would pose to you is, how can you say any of the things we just said, read any of the things we just listened to, and believe it and mean it if you're a Cornell student? Because, first of all, I should just mention uh, the misuse of the word. The translation, is, it's fine, but it dis it, we don't see what it really means. When we say, blessed are the poor, we think of it in some sort of religious way. They're blessed, they're holy. They're, in fact, the hymn did that, which was a mistake. Blessed are you, holy are you. Actually, what Jesus is saying is, you're lucky if you're poor. It's fortunate to be poor. You're blessed in the sense that you're gifted. It's a gift to be poor. That's why people come to Cornell, because they're convinced that to be poor and to be lowly and to be uh, failed is the desire of your life, right? That's why you're here. So either we don't mean these things or we live in one world here, you know, in religion, or with these things that just sort of slip over our heads, and we live in another world at, at Cornell. I mean, to take it in one of its most dramatic ones, Jesus said once, in order to be, if, for a rich person to achieve God, to enter heaven, it's harder for that than it is for to push a camel through an, an eye of a needle. Do you believe that? Really? Like if somebody said to you, look, if you, as, as is true of many of you, if you work really hard here, which many of you do, you're already intellectually gifted or you wouldn't be here. You have the advantage of having a faculty that is enormously gifted, a place that is enormously well connected in the world. If you work really hard here, you expect to be 
effective and maybe distinguished professionals, right, in many things, in medicine and law, distinguished scholars, effective businessmen. You expect to be comfortably off or well off, right? Isn't that what you're here for? Isn't that why you work here? And Jesus says, that's all bad luck. That's what we just read. Those were the readings that we just read. So what does this mean? How can you be both... I mean, unless we're just going to say, we don't care. You know? they just, it's religious language. We don't really mean it. How can you be a Cornelian and a Christian if this is at the, this is at the heart of Christianity? This is Jesus in Matthew's Gospel beginning his great sermon. He's setting the theme for everything he wants to say. And he says, you're fortunate if you're poor. You're fortunate if you're rejected. You're fortunate if you're an outcast. You're fortunate if you fail. To get, if, well, I'm not going to solve this question. I think this question is really something deeply at the heart of being a Christian. But uh, what I'd like to do tonight for a little bit for us is create a kind of horizon, a vision of what he's saying within which it is possible, I think, to live an authentic Christian life and also to be part of an extremely high-powered elite university community and everything that comes after that. But it does take a kind of refined insight into this. So let me just back up a little bit. Where did this come from? Where did the Beatitudes come from? They come out of Hebrew religious experience. And that's what the first reading was about. And that's what Father Dan's mentioned about the remnant earlier on was about. For the Israelites to be alive, to be real, to be who they are, to be alive, to be successful, to be matter in the world, for life to have meaning. For all of that for them, it meant for them to create a community together with God whom they had married in the desert when they were coming out of Egypt. They covenanted with him. And the covenant was that if they used all their talents and things like that, he would help them. He would be with them in some mysterious way so that they would be alive and as a people. That's what they were about. That's what they were for. That's what they were promised. And that's what they promised to do. And they did that for a long time. And then they suffered a series of disastrous setbacks. One finally destroying the country completely. Temple was burned. City was destroyed. All of the effective people were taken away. And there was this tiny remnant, you, <laughs> left the ones who weren't important enough to take away. That's the remnant. That notion, when, when the Israelites began to live with that, they, their theologians, their thinkers, their, their poets, their prophets, began to say, there's a really important insight here. This remnant teaches us something about who we are. And that is that Everything we are, a people, created, you know, all of that kind of stuff, can continue even when our talents have been destroyed. Because actually it is God on whom we need to depend. The, even though all that's left of us is this kind of shattered, meager... Remember the second reading? Not many wise, not many... Remember that? Would you ever read that to a group of people at Cornell? Look around, brothers. <laughs> not many wise, not many noble, not many learned in the ways of the world. That's running through the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures, not as a way of despising the gifts and talents that God made, but as a way of saying, in that circumstance, when you are reduced to the bottom, you recognize the truth that it is actually God who accomplishes this, in some way which we don't experience. That's The same thing came uh, for the Hebrews when they were thinking about the radically poor. Blessed are the poor. 
The radically poor at the time of the Israelites were people like widows, orphans, people who had handicaps. That is, people who could not function. They had no resources to function with in the society. There was no social network as there is in our society. They were completely lost and on their own. So they would recognize that they absolutely needed God. The reason being rich is dangerous. If you marry a really rich woman, Felipe, you know, somebody should say at your wedding, this is dangerous. Okay? The reason it's dangerous is that it takes real insight when things are going very well for you, when you're, all of your talents and stuff are moving and running. It takes real insight a real thirst, a real longing, a real irony to see that there is something deeper and mysterious that you must depend on. That even if you accomplish all of that, it won't be enough for you. The reason success and gifts and talents and money and health, the reason all of that is dangerous, is that you can be fooled into thinking that's all there is about you. If you become completely successful, if your mind develops as much as it can, if you develop a career which is distinguished and important and valuable and you're popular and all of those things, it will not be enough for what you were created for. The prayer said it at the beginning. It was a wonderful prayer tonight. Should have called attention to it at the time. Oh Lord, bring it about that I will love you with my whole heart and I will love every human being in my presence the way you love them. You can't do that. If you develop, the, you, get, you end up here with a four point blah, 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 whatever it is, and you get into this thing that and all that thing, at the heart of it, it's something you're doing with God that you may not recognize it. But if you're thinking about what you're really capable of, you can't do that on your own. If you're really poor, you recognize that. It's like people in a 12-step program. Okay? I mean, they realize, they go to the very bottom, and then they realize that they have to depend on something other than themselves. That's blessed of the poor. That's like saying, well, unless you are in a relationship in which you can actually be wounded and hurt, unless you realize that you depend on another person in order to love and be loved, if you're just safe in the one relationship, you are not fully alive. You're lucky if you're in a situation in which you can recognize the love on which you depend. And it's dangerous to be in a situation where that is hard. To do. So how do you live at a place like Cornell and actually believe that what we just read is God's word, it's the truth? Well, first of all, you trust your wounded parts, your own poverty, whether it's an emotional one or a one, I mentioned it by 30 minutes, it just came up to me when I was talking. There was a thing this week where I just really couldn't forgive something. I couldn't get over a resentment about really some pretty trivial thing that had happened to mess me up. And I realized I couldn't do it. That's lucky. Because then I realized, hey, this is a place where I trust this love, which would maybe, if I was just always the nicest man in the world, you know, I'm always generous and always nothing bother me, hey, what me worry? Do you think that's really good? No. Do you think having lots of money is really good? It's dangerous. Because you can think that that protects you and you don't recognize the real hungers in yourself. So that's on one side, that you, that you trust 
that you recognize the value in the things in your life that reveal to you your need for other people and for this mystery of God. Secondly, that the talents you have are meant to be developed in this way, that they're never completely enough, that they're part of some bigger story, which is the story of the love of God in the world, and that you can give yourself completely, you give your heart to work in Ed Cornell, but you never give it your whole heart. You give your heart, you give your time, but you never give your whole time, that sort of thing. Because you realize that the gifts that you've been given are part of this presence of God in the world. But you can only really live them if you're living them in this, you know, with this awareness of God, this growing. What does that mean in the texture of your life? I have no idea. How do I, have I really answered the question? How can you love the poor and be at Cornell? How can you say it's good to be really humble and humiliated and be at Cornell? Have I really answered that question? No, but at least I hope I've shown that the question is neither silly nor despising the glories of this place, but that it has to do with the subtlety and the complexity of being a believer of being somebody who believes they're loved by God and placed in the world to love God with their whole heart and to love others as God does.